Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya We're reading the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, entitled Transcendental Knowledge. And this evening, text number 25. Daivam eva pare yagnam Daivam eva pare yagnam Yogina paryupasate Yogina paryupasate Brahmagna vapare yagnam Brahmagna vapare yagnam Yagne naivo pajuvati Yagne naivo pajuvati Daivam eva pare yagnam Yogina paryupasate Brahmagna vapare yagnam Yagne naivo Pujayate Daiva me vapare yagnam Yogina paryupasate Brahmagna vapare yagnam Yagne naivo Pajuvati Daivam in worshipping the demigods. Eva like this. Apare some others. Yagnam sacrifices. 
Yogina. Yogina. Mystics. Mystics. Paryupasate. Worship perfectly. Brahma, Brahma of, the of the Absolute Truth. Agno, Agno. in the fire. fire. Apare, others. others. Yagnam, sacrifice. Yajnena, Yajnena. by sacrifice. Eva, Eva, thus, thus. Upajuvati, Upa offer. offer, translation. Some yogis perfectly worship the demigods by offering different sacrifices to them, and some offer sacrifices in the fire of the Supreme Brahman. You can repeat. Some yogis, Some yogis. perfectly worship the demigods by offering different sacrifices to them. And some offer sacrifices in the fire of the Supreme Brahman, Brahman. purport by Srila Prabhupada. As described above, a person engaged in discharging duties in Krishna consciousness is also called a perfect yogi or a first-class mystic. But there are others also who perform similar sacrifices in the worship of demigods and still others who sacrifice to the Supreme Brahman or the impersonal feature of the Supreme Lord. So there are different kinds of sacrifices in terms of different categories. Such different categories of sacrifice by different types of performers only superficially, only superficially demark varieties of sacrifice. Factually, sacrifice means to satisfy the Supreme Lord, Vishnu, who is also known as Yagna. All the different sac varieties of sacrifice can be placed within two primary divisions, namely sacrifice of worldly possessions and sacrifice in pursuit of transcendental knowledge. Those who are in Krishna consciousness sacrifice all material possessions for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord, while others who want some temporary material happiness sacrifice their material possessions to satisfy demigods such as Indra, the sun god, etc. And others who are impersonalists sacrifice their identity by merging into the existence of impersonal Brahman. The demigods are powerful living beings appointed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead for the maintenance and supervision of all material functions like the heating, watering and lighting of the universe. Those who are 
interested in material benefits worship the demigods by various sacrifices according to the Vedic rituals. They are they are called Bhavishwara Vadi or believers in many gods but others who worship the impersonal feature of the absolute truth and regard the forms of the demigods as temporary sacrifice the individual self in the supreme fire and thus end their individual existence by merging into the existence of the supreme. Such impersonalists sacrifice their time in philosophical speculation to understand the transcendental nature of the supreme. In other words, the fruit of workers sacrifice their material possessions for material enjoyment, whereas the impersonalist sacrifice, sacrifices his material designations with a view to merging into the existence of the Supreme. For the impersonalist, the fire altar of sacrifice is the Supreme Brahman and the offering of the Self being consumed by the fire of Brahman. The Krishna conscious person, like Arjuna however, sacrifices everything for the satisfaction of Krishna and thus all his material possessions as well as his own Self everything is sacrificed for Krishna. Thus he is the first class yogi, but he does not lose his individual existence. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Na Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitam Scha Hey Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanudhate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha kaupata rubyascha kripa sindhu bhayevacha patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha namo vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shrimati bhakti vedanta swaminiti namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar 
Srivasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So here, our, our Lord Krishna is describing about different sacrifices which we can perform. Sacrifice means to give up something for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Sacrifice of, means for the Supreme Lord, for Lord Vishnu. But some people they will make sacrifices not for the Supreme Lord Vishnu but for other gods, for demigods, for people like, well Prabhupada mentions in the purport, Indra, the rain god, and Surya, the sun god. Some people make sacrifices for Lord Shiva, some people make sacrifices for Mother Durga or Ganesh. There are many different demigods. And people often worship these personalities to get some material benefit. So to get benefit from the demigods is not very intelligent because the benefits they will give will always be material. It will be limited and it will be temporary. So you may get some benefit from them, but the benefit will not last very long. So people who worship demigods, they are described as being less intelligent. Not, not, in other words, they're not very intelligent people because they, they're simply desiring to get some benefit which is limited and temporary. Why should we get something which is limited? We should want unlimited, right? We, we should want the benefit we want to, it should be unlimited and it should be eternal. It shouldn't be temporary. So if you want to get that kind of benefit, you have to worship the Supreme Lord, Vishnu or Krishna. There's no difference between Vishnu and Krishna. Both are the Supreme Lord and they can both give us the ultimate benefit. So there are many examples of people who worship demigods and they were not able to succeed. Just like there was one devotee of Lord Shiva, his name was Vrika and he worshipped Lord Shiva. He, he would make sacrifice to worship Shiva and he would cut flesh off of his body to offer it in the fire to Lord Shiva. He would cut, he had a knife and he would cut flesh off his body and put it in the fire in the, as an offering to Lord Shiva. So he was not, Lord Shiva was still not appearing to him. He wanted Lord Shiva should tell him, should, he wanted Lord Shiva should ask him, what do you want? What blessing do you want? But he was cutting flesh, but still nothing, Lord Shiva was not saying anything. So finally he decided he would cut off his own head and offer his own head as a sacrifice. So he took bath, he took his bath in the nearby lake, right, big lake here, <laughs> take bath there and come out of the lake and then he was ready to cut off his head. But just before he could cut off his head, Lord Shiva appeared. Because Lord Shiva is very kind and compassionate to people, so he did not want this man to kill himself. So he appeared and then he asked the man, what benediction do you want? What blessing do you want? 
So the man said, I want the blessing that whosever head I will touch, their head will fall off. So it was a very stupid blessing. Not very, this, this is typical of the kind of things which people want when they worship demigods, they get, they want benefits which is just trouble, just, just foolish. So this man, he asked Lord Shiva, I want to touch, I, whosever head I touch, their head should fall off. So Lord Shiva, he had to say, okay, all right, you know, you can have the blessing. He could not deny the man because he he asked the man, what blessing do you want? So Lord Shiva agreed, all right. But then the man decided he wanted to touch Lord Shiva's head. And he, he, and he, was, he, he told Lord Shiva, let me touch your head to see if it works. And Lord Shiva had to run, he was running, the man was chasing him, he said, no, come back, let me try. The man was running and running. Lord Shiva was, didn't know what to do. So, finally, of course, Lord Vishnu came to help him. Lord Vishnu came disguised as a young Brahmana boy. And Lord Vishnu said to Vrika, he said to the demon, he said, what's wrong? And Vrika said, oh, I want to touch this Shiva's head. I want to test the blessing he gave me. And the Brahmana boy told Rika, he said, oh, don't believe Shiva, you know, he che he's che been cheating people, he must have cheated you also. I don't believe he could give you that blessing. You try for yourself, touch your own head and see. So he put his hand on his own head and his own head fell off. So he was saved. So Lord Shiva was saved by the mercy of Lord Vishnu. But that's the typical kind of thing which happens when people worship demigods. They want foolish benedictions. Whatever blessings they get from the demigods, it is limited and it is temporary. And people who are devoted to these demigods, they will only be able to go to the planet of the demigods they won't be able to get free of birth and death. They'll simply stay in the material world and they'll stay devoted to some particular demigod. Anyway, people perform these sacrifices. We're told there's two different kinds of sacrifice. One is to sacrifice possessions. In other words, you may have some property, you may have some wealth, Whatever you have, you can give it for the, you know, as a sacrifice. You may offer it, if you offer it to the demigods, then it's not very intelligent. We should offer everything to the Supreme Lord. So, if you offer to the Supreme Lord, then you get the ultimate benefit. You can get freed of birth and death. But you have to offer everything, right? If you offer body, if you, if, uh, according to how much you surrender, Krishna will reward you accordingly. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Ye yatamam prapadyante tamsta taiva bhajami. As you surrender, I reward you accordingly. So if you surrender only half of your possessions to Krishna, then he will only reward you half. You'll only get half <laughs> the result you wanted. But we should give everything to Krishna. We should surrender fully to Krishna. Of course, we won't be able to surrender immediately to Krishna. We won't be able to surrender everything immediately. But gradually, we want to do that. You want to come to that point. We came to the world when we were born in this world, we were born with nothing. And when we leave the world, we'll take nothing with us. So it's beneficial to us if we will sacrifice whatever we have while we're alive, if you give it for the service of the Lord. 
if you keep it for yourself, then time of death, you'll leave it, you'll lose it. Somebody else will take it. Your husband will take it. Your children will take it. Your relatives will take it. Your friends will take it. Whatever we have, be taken by others. Because we've gone. We leave the body. We can't take anything with us. So, it's best that while we're here in this world, that we make a sacrifice, to get to sacrifice for the pleasure of the Supreme Law. That is the ultimate sacrifice. As Srila Prabhupada says in the purport, a devotee like Arjuna will sacrifice everything for the service of Lord Krishna. You see Arjuna here, Arjuna is on the battlefield at Kurukshetra and he's going to fight a battle. But he didn't want to fight. But he will do it anyway because Lord Krishna wants him to do it. He's ready to give up his life for the service of Krishna. So that's a, that's a, a great sacrifice, that's the ultimate sacrifice to give everything, to sacrifice even your own life for the service of the Supreme Lord. So, while we have the material body, we want to use it for the pleasure of the Supreme. If we use it for our own pleasure, that is not very good. If we're only thinking about our own enjoyment, in other words, satisfying my bodily senses, that will keep us in the material world. But if we use our body and senses for the service of the Supreme Lord, that will liberate us from the material world. That will take us out of the wheel of birth and death. So, there's another kind of sacrifice which is described the offering in the fire of the Supreme Brahman. So this is, imperson this is for the impersonalists, those who worship the impersonal Brahman. They don't worship the Supreme Lord, the deities, they don't worship Lord Krishna. They worship just simply the energy of the Supreme the impersonal Brahman, the, the Brahma Jyoti. And they may offer their self, their identity into the fire of the Brahman. In other words, they are going, they want to merge into the oneness, into that oneness of the Brahman. Actually, you can never give up your identity. We have, a, we have an, a, a, our spiritual identity and that spiritual identity is eternal. The body is not eternal, but our spirit soul, our spiritual identity is eternal. That is not going to change. We have to, but the impersonalists these people who are worshipping the fire of the Brahman, they're giving up, they want to give up their individuality. In other words, they want a type of liberation which is called Sayujya Mukti, which means merging into the oneness of the Supreme Brahman. Right? We are also Brahman. We are Brahman, but they, they just think everything is only, there's only the Supreme Brahman. They don't recognize that there's a Brahman, tiny parts of the Brahman and the Parabrahman. Because they are impersonalists, they don't believe in eternal personality. They simply believe only in the oneness of a Brahman, the spiritual existence, the Supreme Brahman. And their goal is to merge into that oneness and in this way give up their individuality. But Lord Krishna has already said 
Natvevaham jatu na sham, natvam neme jana dipaha, natchevana bavishyama sarvevayama taparam. Never was there a time when I did not exist. Lord Krishna is speaking. He said, never was there a time when I, meaning Lord Krishna, did not exist. Nor you, all of you, nor all of these kings. You are all eternal. We are all eternal spiritual beings. Lord Krishna is eternal. We are eternal. All the living entities, they are all eternal. The body is not eternal. But the soul is eternal. So the soul is a part of the Brahman. But Lord Krishna is not part of the Brahman. Lord Krishna is the Para Brahman, the Supreme Brahman. And the parts of the Brahman, they come from that Supreme Brahman. So we are all parts of Krishna. Part of Krishna, but not equal to Krishna. We're tiny. Lord Krishna is very great. We're very tiny, very uh, infinitesimal. But Lord Krishna, he's infinite, he's very big, very great. So we are tiny parts. And bec because we are very small, we're easily covered by the material energy. We fall into illusion. So the impersonalists and the jnanis, they may do like the, their sacrifice is in the fire of the impersonal Brahman. They make that sacrifice to become one, to enter into the oneness, to lose their individuality. Just like maybe you heard, there was a, there was a song, it was a long time ago now, but they were saying, I am you and you are me and we are all one together in the one, right? I am you and you are me, we're all one. They're talking about merging into the oneness of the Brahman, you see? So that one, that is impersonalism. So that is not the desire of a devotee. A devotee who is practicing bhakti yoga, he doesn't want that kind of liberation. Because that kind of liberation does not allow one to engage in devotion. There's no activities in the impersonal Brahman. There's no variety. There's no relationships. There's only the oneness. So it's very boring. You go to that kind of place, no activity, no relationships, no variety, nothing. It's just only the oneness. Just like if you, if you go to Buddhist temples sometimes, you know, some people, they, they go for a weekend to do a meditation in the Buddhist temple and they tell you, don't talk to anybody, don't speak to anyone, don't look at anyone, just concentrate on the nothing, on the void, the nothingness, you know. So that is Buddhism, that's their activity. Nothing. Don't look, don't talk, don't speak. Just concentrate on nothing. Make your mind blank. How long can you do it for? Not very long. It's not natural. It's not the nature. A nature of the soul is to have activities. Our, our spiritual nature is to have activities, to have, but to have activities which give pleasure to the Supreme. So we have to learn how to do that, how to, what kind of things actually give pleasure to the Supreme Lord. So that is why we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. We chant the names of the Lord and we read the book spoken by Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita. We read the book and we worship Krishna. So these three things are very important. To chant the names of the Lord, to read the books about the Lord, and to worship the Lord. If you do these three things, these are spiritual activities. These are not material activities. 
And when you engage in spiritual activities, then we connect with the Supreme. Yoga means to connect, to link. So we connect with Him when we engage in activities of devotion. We say devotion. Reading the books is devotion. Worshipping Krishna, devotion. Chanting the name of Krishna, devotion. That devotion is there within all of us. But often you see people, they, they forget about Krishna and instead they devote themselves to a dog. You know, they have their dog, you, you can see people with their dogs. And you take care of the dog. You know, time for Krishna, you know. <laughs> have to worship the dog, feed the dog, clean the dog, you know, walk the dog. This is how people pass their life, you know. And we have forgotten Krishna. Instead, we've devoted, we devote ourselves to dogs and motor cars and so many other things, you know. Everybody ha ev everyone is devoted to something. But the proper devotion is to the Supreme Lord. And that devotion to the Supreme Lord that will carry you out of the material world. You can get free of birth and death. You can get liberation. But if you worship the dog or whatever, you come back. Next life you come back in the material world. You may come back as a dog, you know, you don't know. Yeah, we have to be very careful how we spend our life, what activities we do. What are we doing with this human life? So Lord Krishna is teaching us, teaching here Arjuna, how there are different kinds of yogis. And they worship the demi they may worship the demigods perfectly, but that worship, or because they're worshipping demigods, it's wrongly placed. They're worshipping it, it's like instead of going to the man in charge of the office, you go to some clerk. You go to some lesser clerk in the office and you offer him a bribe and you tell him, you know, give me this and don't tell the boss, you know. So going to demigods is like bribing somebody. We have to go, we understand there's the Supreme Lord and we have to approach the Supreme Lord. And we approach the Supreme Lord, we don't approach him directly, but we approach through the spiritual teacher. So Prabhupada is there spiritual teachers, the acharyas, they're there and they guide us and they introduce us to the Supreme Lord. We approach the Lord through his devotees, the devotees, the great acharyas, the teachers, they can bring us, they can introduce us to the Supreme Lord. So we have to take shelter of the, the devotees and by the grace of the devotees, then we will come to the to know Krishna, to know who is actually the Supreme. But if you worship demigods, you worship other people who are not the Supreme, then you you, you get some material benefit, but it will be temporary. Just like you may worship some god to get money. People will worship usually Lakshmi. They want wealth, they will worship the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. They, get, they may get money, but then when they get the money, then they get some other problem, maybe a health problem. Oh, and then when they have a health problem, they have to worship somebody else to get healthy again, right? Who are you going to worship? Maybe you have to worship the sun god, maybe, to get healthy. And then when you get healthy again, then you've got money and you've got healthy again, but then somebody may cheat you, you, are, you may have family problems, you may have some trouble in your family life, and that, that can cause you so much disturbance. So there's so many problems to, to go wrong in the material world. And we worship some, temp, some God to get relief, can only give temporary relief 
for some time, not eternal benefit. So we want to be very cautious how or who we make sacrifice for. The sacrifice should be for the pleasure of Vishnu and that will give us the benefit of getting out from the material world. At least it will guarantee that we will take a good birth in the next life. We will at least be guaranteed a human body and we can be born in a, a good family, a pious family, so that from the beginning of life we can cultivate spiritual knowledge. So Bhagavad Gita describes like that, that if we, if we begin this process of devotion, and even if we don't complete it in this life, in the next life we'll be born in a position where we can easily continue and go on to perfect our practice, right? To be born in a family of devotees, just like Srila Prabhupada, he was born in a family of devotees. So from his childhood he was already a devotee. And he studied Sanskrit, and he studied these uh, Madanga and like that when he was a little boy. He was a little boy, he was already doing Rathiatra, his own Rathiatra. So he had that upbringing from his childhood. You know, I know my childhood was nothing like that, you know. I spent my childhood on a football field, you know, playing football most of my life, you know. <laughs> Running after a ball, <laughs> wasting my time in so many ways. So, we want to make a sacrifice for our ultimate benefit and we get the highest benefit by sacrificing for Lord Krishna. Okay, is there any question? Anybody? Any question? Yamuna has a question. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Um, so, uh, we hear so many times that when we meditate on nothing, it's actually not um, leading us anywhere. But still we have, like, as we know, people that really feel some ecstatic, whatever, um, stages of mind when they just concentrate on nothing. And to some extent it works. So how to overcome that jealousy that they're feeling like they, they speak of like really um, exotic experiences and when we chant Japa sometimes we don't feel anything or fall asleep. So how to see it in the right way? All right. Somebody meditates on nothing and they feel some ecstasy. Where is it leading them to? the nothing. Where is it taking them? It's taking them nowhere. They're meditating on nothing. In other words, they're not real, right? That, that, that is their meditation, nothing. You're, and other, they're not real, they don't exist. The world is not real, nothing is real. Okay, so if I take a brick and hit them on the head with it, it's not real, right? You know, they're saying, they're meditating on nothing and they're feeling ecstasy. That is the ecstasy of nothing. It's simply their illusion that they're feeling some ecstasy, meditating on nothing. And you say, we are chanting Hare Krishna, we're not feeling anything. Well, that's our problem. We're not chanting very well we're not feeling anything. We have to chant with more attention. Certainly we can feel the presence of Krishna in the holy name. We should feel pleasure in chanting the holy name. Lord Chaitanya says, anandan buddhivardhanam pratipadam purnamritasvadhanam. It's the bathing of the soul 
It's the life of all transcendental knowledge, the ocean of transcendental bliss. So there is something there in the holy name. We are not finding it. We have to improve our chanting. We have to go deeper into chanting. We need to chant more. And we need to hear more. We need to do more service. These things will allow us to come to experience the nectar of the Holy Name. Join in the Sankirtan. Take part in the Sankirtan, the chanting of the Holy Name. And we can feel ecstasy, you can feel. Of course, ecstasy may come, it may not come. You may not get ecstasy, but you know you're doing the right thing. You're chanting the Holy Name. You sh we should have faith in what we're doing, that this is what Krishna wants us to do. Lord Chaitanya himself came and chanted the Holy Name. He did Sankirtan. And Prabhupada told us to do Sankirtan and Prabhupada himself did a lot of Sankirtan. So we should have faith in the chanting of the Holy Name, that this Holy Name, this is the Dharma for the Kali Yuga. And Lord Chaitanya quoted Kali Tantara Upanishad, right? You know the verse. Hari Nam, Hari Nam, Hari Nam Eva Kevalam, Kaloa Nasteva 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 Gatir Anyata. That in the Kali Yuga there is no other way but the Holy Name. Not by karma, not by jnana, not by yoga, only by chanting the Holy Name. It's the Holy Name which is the Yuga Dharma. We have to chant the Holy Name. There is nectar there in the Holy Name. Why are we not tasting the nectar? Because we have the jaundice of materialism. In Upadesh Amrita, Rupa Goswami gives the example about the person with jaundice. If you go to India now, this time of the year, it's very hot. You know, temperature may be come up to like 50 in the daytime. Very hot. And if you're not careful, you can easily get jaundice. If you drink some impure water or something, you get jaundice. So how to cure jaundice? I got jaundice when I first went to India. That was a long time ago. But I went to India and I got jaundice. And they said, there's no medicine. I didn't know what to do. And then this other devotee told me, he said, drink sugar cane. He said, that will help you to cure the liver. Because the liver is not functioning properly. If you drink sugar cane water, it, sugar cane juice, it will help you to get the liver healthy. So I like sugar cane juice, so I thought, oh, good, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Nice medicine, sugar cane. But when I got the sugar cane and I started to drink it, oh, it was horrible, it tasted terrible. And I said, what, what is this? This is not sugar cane. He said, no, it's sugar cane. I said, it's not, it tastes terrible. He said, yes, because you've got disease, you've got jaundice. Your liver is not working properly, so you cannot taste the sweetness of the sugar cane juice. You have to drink more, you have to keep drinking it, and gradually your liver will become healthy. So the holy name is like that, Madhaji. You have to, ch you have to taste the neck, you have to chant the holy name more, more chanting and you will taste the nectar of the Holy Of course, not every day you're going to get nectar. Some days Krishna will reveal to you nectar, and other days, you know, okay, you're chanting the Holy Name. You should feel satisfied to chant the Holy Name, that this is what Srila Prabhupada wants us to do. This is the Yuga Dharma. Lord Chaitanya established this Yuga Dharma we're following the acharyas by chanting the holy name. We should feel pleasure to do that. 
There is nectar in the holy name, but we may not be tasting it because we have jaundice. The jaundice of materialism. How to overcome it? More chanting, more devotion, more seva, and you will taste more nectar in the holy name when you do that. Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki, Bhagavad Gita ki, Gaur Premanande.